Today we are starting a brand new series called Don't Give Up. The title comes from a key phrase in Hebrews chapter 12. And for those who love getting the point, just give me the point, Chris. I want the main point so I can lock it down and move on from there. Here's the big point. When all you can see is the overwhelming circumstance, turn your eyes, train your eyes to see Jesus over the circumstance. Fix your eyes on him and don't give up. That's the main point. That's it. That you and I would learn how to not let the challenging circumstance become our main point of view. And so often that happens. We see that only, and we fail to look at Jesus instead as being greater. Because our God is greater than no matter how bad the, the circumstance is. Amen? Our God is greater. Amen? Oh, come on, people. Our God is greater. Amen? Yeah, he's bigger than the circumstance. And we got to remember that, especially when we're going through tough ones, really challenging ones. Simple and sweet. It sounds good. Easier said than done, done though. Pastor and author Kyle, Kyle Eidelman he actually wrote a book with the same title on this, and he explained it out. And really, I want to encourage you to pick up this book. Go to Amazon, go during the service, pick it up. Or if you want, we actually have copies of this book available at Next Steps in the Lobby for you to buy at cost, okay? You can pick them up then. And, and again, usually we like to give out books for free if we can. Not this time we can't, but we want to be able to have you at least have the resource. You can buy them then and there and pick one up for yourself. Now, we're going to refer reference Kyle's book through the next six weeks for the series. Don't worry, for those who are freaking out, we're not replacing the Bible, okay, with this book. We're using this book as a springboard into the Bible, as we do so often with other books that we read too. But I think Kyle really nails it. He lays it out, gives us some, some, some tactics on how to apply this phrase, how to apply this encouragement, how, so that we don't give up. Now, now, back to the Bible, okay, so I want you to know that we're going to be using Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Three verses. Three verses. If you have your Bibles, go there now. If you're online, BibleGateway.com, or if you're watching a church online, there's a Bible in it. So go ahead and go there, or just bring it up on your phones if you're in the room today. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Now, these three verses are going to be our base camp for the entire six weeks. Just three verses. Nuts. We'll talk about some more verses, too. But it'll be a base camp for the entire time. And, and I want to encourage you and, and challenge you, and these verses are going to help us to do that, to not give up and to run the race that God has set for us. Now, as a pastor, people will often um, come and, and reach out to me if they're going through tough times. I'm not the, uh, the answer man. I'm not the uh, capital S shepherd for people. I'm just a, 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 usually a voice of encouragement. And when they come to me, they, 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 they just want some, some help. And, and I'll, try to, I'll try to help them, and, and they're going through some kind of challenge. I'll usually just listen to them, I'll, I'll encourage them, and I'll absolutely pray for them. Some of these meetings happen to be on my calendar, which is nice, but most of them are not on my calendar. <laughs> and they happen throughout the, throughout the week. Like, I'll get a phone call just going into the grocery store. Stop and pick that up, listen, help, encourage, pray. Or on my way back from a softball game, from my girls' softball game, you know, or just driving along, listen, help, pray, and encourage. Or, you know, sitting in my doctor's office where I'm there to get a, for a skin appointment. All of a sudden I get a phone call, pick it up, and help, just encourage, and pray. And, and, and I thought about all these things and just encouraging people as I reflect on all of them. What I'm saying to, to all of them is pretty much the same thing. I'm saying the same thing to all of them, no matter what they're going through, and, and really trying to be specific still, of course, to everybody's specific issues and, and challenges, you know, I might modify it a bit, but the underlying message is the same every time. Let me give you a few examples of people I'm talking about. A young couple has been married a couple of years. They're fighting all the time. They each believe that they've married the wrong person. And they feel that divorce is the best path for them. They need some encouragement. Or another example of a husband who's been out of work close, close to a year now. He's beginning to give up hope ever finding employment. Feels like he's failed his family. He feels like a, a failure himself. That guy needs some encouragement. Or how about a woman who's, who's uh, discouraged because of her past and her mistakes. And uh, as the years pass and go by, it goes by, she thinks that no one would ever want her or love her again. She needs some encouragement. Or how about this, a couple who's had a third grader, a third grader who's, who's really losing a battle to a deadly disease? They're so tired of seeing their beloved child in pain. They're becoming increasingly angry with God. 
Or how about the older lady who struggled with deep and a deep depression for her so long of her life? After trying so many different treatments, she believes she'll never feel happy again. Or how about the man who had an affair and he knows he blew it? His unfaithfulness has destroyed his wife, his family. He feels guilt. He doesn't know what to do with it, so he does nothing. A family, how about this? A family with special needs child. The challenges of raising their child has entirely overwhelms them, and they're just at a point of just exhaustion. Or how about the student athlete who works hard at practice every, every day? And the coach keeps not seeing it and not putting this athlete in. And the athlete's just ready to give up. I keep going on and on all service long about stories like this, and you know you have stories of your own too. The question I have right now is what would, you, what, would you, what would you say? What would you say to people like this? What do you think specifically people like this need to hear when they're going through extreme challenges like this? Or, or just, just challenges in general? What do they need to hear? Now, for the longest time, I thought they kind of didn't need to hear from a guy like this, Mr. Rogers, you know? Mr. Rogers, you know, he sits there, and, he, and he's super sweet, you know, and, they, and everyone kind of needs a Mr. Rogers where they sit down with you, and he just kind of takes his shoes off. Hey, welcome to the neighborhood. I'm so glad you're here. How are you doing? Tell me about your challenges. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> let's, let's just pray a prayer for you right now. And, you know, and I love Mr. Rogers, and I love that idea of comfort. I think all of us want comfort. All of us want someone to care, to listen, to not try to distract us or dominate the conversation with their own experiences and, or tell us that we should just get over it. We want someone like a Mr. Rogers to help us, to say, I'm sorry, it's, you know, I'm sure it's all going to work out. And that's a good thing. But I think, that, you know, even though that's what we want, I don't think that's what we need. I think what we need more often as I walk through this in years of ministry is someone like this guy, William Wallace from Braveheart, okay? Someone with a painted face all blue just saying, you got to get back out there. You got to not give up. You got to keep going. You got to stop letting this thing destroy you and get back up. Let's do it. I mean, you need a guy like that. And I, and, and I know it's a fragile way to do that and bring that to someone's attention when they're hurting. But I think that's what we need more and more. We need someone to help us to say, you're not alone. Yeah, I know it's hard, but don't give up. Keep going. We can do this. We're not going to give up. More often than not, this message, I think, again, don't give up, keep going, don't stop, ha hang on, hold fast, stand firm, never quit. I think we just kind of tune that out and we, we kind of cater more to the comfort. But that's what we need, though. We need this message to not give up. And that's what we're going to talk about during this series. We're going to do it by leaning on God's strength and his word. We're going to lean on God. We're not going to make the solution be, hey, guys, let's all have positive vibes right now. Hold hands and just sing kumbaya. It's not going to be that. Guys, it's actually going to be very tactical. We're going, to, we're going to lean into specifically God and his word. Speaking of his word, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says this. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Again, it's the challenge to say, hey, I know your circumstance is difficult. I know what you're going through has got to be incredibly challenging. But right now, what you need to do is focus on Jesus more so than the challenge. Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't take three extra shots tonight in order to forget about it. That's not the answer. The answer is to focus on Jesus first and foremost because our God is greater. Amen? That's who he is. And when we do that, when we focus on Jesus first, then we see our challenge from a different perspective. We're no longer looking at it like this. Oh, God, it's so huge. We're looking at it this way. Oh, that's all you got, circumstance? We're looking at it from a different perspective because we got God helping us understand and remember that he's bigger and greater than all of it. Still difficult, though. Still tough. And sometimes our biggest critic in the world, the biggest um, <laughs> the biggest person standing against us, oh, it's the enemy, right? It's the enemy, right? No, Chris, guys, the biggest critic sometimes is ourselves. It's, it's, the, it's the thing in your mind saying things like this. You might as well forget it. What are you trying to do this for? You've tried before. It ain't going to work. You might as well just give up. 
it, it's not going to change. God's forgetting, forgotten about you. He doesn't care about your, your circumstance. Move on and realize that it will not change. Friends, that voice we got to push back on. We often feel this way. We want someone to feel sorry for us. In fact, we get upset or hurt. We get upset when people don't feel sorry for us, don't we? We tell them, we tell them our story, and we're waiting for the, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, the head, the head tilt, you know. And when we don't get the head tilt, we go like, hey, I have a messed up life. I'm screwed up. You need to understand how screwed up I am. And we want them to see it. Oh, friends, that can be dangerous. Also, too, we, I believe we often need more. What we need more than comfort is courage. What we need more than sympathy is strength. Let me ask this question. Have you ever heard of the NFL place kicker named Blair Walsh? Anybody? Okay, raise your hand. Anybody? Come on now. Blair, yeah, that means you're all Minnesota fans, most likely, okay? Minnesota fans know the name Blair Walsh big time, okay? And here's why. See, in 2015-2016 NFL season, the Vikings place kicker named Blair Walsh made an NFL high 34 field goals before the Vikings playoff game against the Seattle Seahawks. He had converted 33 of 34 kicks inside 30 yards. That's a chip shot. It's easy. No big deal. No, well, easier, okay? So when the Vikings were down 10-9 with 22 seconds left and Walsh lined up for his 27-yard field goal, which should be an easy chip shot, he shanked it. It went wide. It sailed wide. This Viking season came to an end. It wasn't like, do overs, try again. It was done. And, and, and just so you know, to say the least, the Viking fans were a little disappointed. Yeah, as they yelled out to him as he's leaving the field, you suck, I wish you were dead. Chanting it. Just, we wish you were dead. Now you go, oh, it's just a sport. It's sport. It's a, you're right, it is. Oh, it didn't stop that day either. It kept being piled on the next day. The news piled on. The more social media posts. You suck. Wish you were dead. You've ruined it. Every, you know, just nonstop piling on top of this young man. Now, in the midst of the social media storm directed against Walsh, a group of first graders in Minnesota set out to encourage the brokenhearted kicker. Get this. This story was, this story was awesome to find. They decided to encourage him by writing and sending him some encouraging cards. First grader Allie Edwards said, said this, Blair was really sad, and we wanted to make him feel better, so we thought we would send him some cards. And one of her classmates wrote, Dear Blair Walsh, I think you should keep trying. Don't give up. We still love you. Get better by practicing. <laughs> hey, another, another, another wrote Walsh and told them he was the best kicker in the universe. Told him that. Tyler Dopen filled a whole page for Walsh with big letters. Dear Blair, I, tell, I feel bad for you. I don't give up. You're still number one. Practice. And there's tons of misspelled words here. <laughs> Anyways, but first graders. No, <laughs> practice. Practice more so you can get better at, at kicking, C-I-C-I-N-G. <laughs> You're so good at kicking, so don't give up. Keep trying. We still love you. And yet another classmate added to all this by saying, You're so handsome. Don't give up. Don't, don't give up. <laughs> the kid's act of kindness got his attention. He was so touched to hear from the kids who didn't know him at all that he pushed his flight home back a full day to visit the classroom. He went to them. These kids were pumped to see Walsh. Walsh was pumped to spend time with them. After the visit, and they were, they were just so pumped. After the visit, Walsh said it was so touching uh, those encouraging cards were, were, were so pretty and so creative, and I will cherish them forever. You know, many of us need courage more than comfort. And it was so interesting that day, Blair Walsh found courage coming from post-kindergartners. It was courage from them, saying, don't give up. You've got to keep going. Yeah, it was a bad kick, but you keep going because you're so handsome. <laughs> you're so pretty. <laughs> Don't give up. Keep going. Now, it's a cute story, but you think, okay, well, that, that's, let's move on, Chris. Well, God wasn't done. God was not done with Blair Walsh's missed kick to change lives for the better. Cameron. Cameron, this Midwest 14-year-old girl, she describes herself as the biggest Blair Walsh fan on earth. Cameron was just so impressed 
with how Walsh handled the kick. Now, she handled the kick freaking out. She was not mad. She was sad for Blair because she's a big fan. She was mad at the immediate reaction from the fans. She started punching pillows and things all over the house because she was so ticked off that people were so harsh to Blair Walsh. Now, the thing about Blair, what he did is that he never blamed anyone. He didn't, bl he didn't blame the holder, the weather. He didn't say, laces out, Finkel, you know, <laughs> whatever. It, 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 that wasn't him. He was like, he wasn't angry. He was just like, hey, it was my bad. Bad kick, it came off from my foot. She loved that. And she defended him just to the nth degree that, it, you know, he's a good man. There's always people on social media. Now, now, Cameron's mother was impressed with how Cameron defended Walsh. Just thought that she was just a great, you know, daughter, you know, and also a really big fan of Blair Walsh. What mom didn't know was that her little girl had been battling anxiety and depression for over a year. And it wasn't until four months after Walsh's missed kick that mom found out from a guidance counselor at school that Cameron was cutting herself. She has made multiple suicide attempts. Mom rushed down there, held her baby girl, got her treatment right away. Mom was able to help Cameron. Coming out of the, the, the treatment felt led to share her story on social media, which in her words was very difficult to do. Very private matter. She didn't want to be judged even more harshly because that's what was in her head. She had all these negative thoughts about what people thought, thought about her, but she decided to let it out there. And, and, and let people know the hope that she's found and the treatment that she's found and, the, and what she's trying to do. She's trying to say, I'm not perfect still. I still have bad days, but here it is. That, that little post got 9,000 shares. It made its way around the social media quite a bit. A few months later, when the Vikings football team started their summer camp training, Blair Walsh was still on the team. Uh, they went home after that day losing the Seahawks. They came back, you know, for, for training in the summertime that same year. And Cameron, you know, this is about a couple months removed after her treatment, she saw on the news the fans could fill out postcards writing to their favorite players. Well, she's a Blair Walsh fan. And the postcards were simple. They just said, good luck this season. I hope you fill in the blank. Cameron filled in the blank this way. Listen to this. She's all, good luck this season. I hope you continue to inspire people like me every day. Last year, I developed depression because I cared so much about what people thought about me. Thoughts like harming myself flooded my head, and I began to self-harm. Then in the playoff game, you missed that game-winning field goal. The whole world seemed to be against you, but you had the most positive attitude ever. You inspired me, and I stopped cutting and caring what others thought of me. Thank you so much. I'm currently cut-free and happy as ever. Keep your head up. You're the reason I didn't give up. Months later, halfway through the regular season, Walsh finally received the cards. He read her card, then just his own, did his own research, did her, po her social media posts, saw what she went through, her whole journey. He reached out and said, hey, and this, this was an incredible part of the story. Um, he basically said, you know, he, he, with a mom, I had to find the story in two different spots. And, and one didn't have this, but it had the, the, the perception of the mom what happened. The mom got a phone call. And and that day, what Cameron says is that she was having a bad day. When you have depression and anxiety, you go up and down. She had a bad day, and she was considering hurting herself again that day when she went to school. Came back home, was super discouraged, and then her mom goes, you got a message on the voicemail on our home phone. Listen to it. And it was from the Minnesota Vikings saying that Blair Walsh would like to meet with you. It was the perfect timing that God had set up for this young lady. Perfect timing. And Blair Walsh made the trip out there, and the two of them sat together, and you know, and they got to, to connect and share stories. He was able to encourage her and vice versa. And, and uh, you know, and as I'm reading this whole thing, I'm going, this guy's got to be a Christian. He's got to be a Christian. I mean, Sports Illustrator does not say anything about his faith at all. But I'm like, dude, this guy has the faith, uh, has the face of someone who has faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? There's no, I mean, his integrity alone. And then I found this on a different site, quoting what he said. He said, there's a higher plan that I'm not really aware of right now. But I trust him, Jesus, and I trust the plan that he has for me, and I'll continue to do my best. Do my best. This guy is a believer, loves the Lord. And, it, and, and the, the integrity that he's modeled, the, the perseverance, it was rooted in his faith. And here he is thinking, I shanked this big, you know, big, 
big kick and my life's over. No, it's not. He has a bigger perception of what life is about. And here he is trusting God along the way, not knowing what's going to happen, how God's going to use this missed kick to do great things. What's the missed kick in your life? Do you think it's ruined you? It's done. It's over. Don't you think that God can take a missed kick and, and bring something incredible out of it? Now, do not believe for a second that God, I don't believe that he caused the missed kick in your life in order to, like, show off later on. No, our God knows we live in a messed up world. But he has the ability and the power to take me- messed up kicks and make something right come from it. Amen? That's what he's done. See, this story, it's a reminder also of the we factor, the, the not alone factor. How God brought together a, a kicker and a, and a first grade class and a, and a 14-year-old kid in the Midwest. How he brought people together to encourage one another and say, you're not alone. Don't give up. As we study Hebrews 11 and 12, we'll discover the Hebrews writer, the author, speaking courage into our lives daily. We see in Hebrews, in, in verse 1 of Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so e- easily entangles. Let us, I love that. The given times us is talked about already. Us. It's a team effort. We're not meant to do it alone. Hey, go, go, I love it. Keep going. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on who? Oh, come on now. On who? Jesus. Yeah, on Jesus, not on the horrible circumstance. Easier said than done, but there's power when we do so. Keep going. For the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, think about Jesus when you're tempted to give up. He'll empower you and strengthen you to not. The implication here, when the author writes this, is that the readers are going through a tough time. The implication here is that they're going through a rough patch. They are going, if they're not feeling bad and, and, and bummed out, they're going to be. They're going to be discouraged eventually. They're going to be overwhelmed. They're going to feel beat down. And when they do, the author gives them instruction on how to handle the hard-hitting times of life. Check out the first verse of this passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. The therefore points us back to the previous chapter in Hebrews 11. And in, in, in Hebrews 11, you read what's often called the Faith Hall of Fame. It's a list of all these people that you often read in the Old Testament who displayed an incredible faith following God and trusting him no matter what. See, these heroes of the faith are our cloud. They are the great cloud of witnesses. They are part of it. The heroes of the faith, those who've gone before us, are part of the great cloud of witnesses around us. And the great cloud is not standing back going, loser, loser, loser or you suck, wish you would die. That's not the crowd. This crowd's saying, keep going. You got this. Don't give up. You keep running. You keep going. That's what they're saying. And I love this too. We see our first how-to point in this verse. First how-to point, how to not give up, listen to the crowd. Listen to this crowd. This faith hall of fame. Throughout the series, we're going to look at some of these witnesses specifically. We're going to learn from their experiences. We're going to look at this Faith Hall of Fame and see how we can really, you know, learn from people who, who have faced seemingly impossible situations, but yet came out of it because of our great God. And we need to listen to the crowd in order to not give up. Take Abraham, for example. Abraham, Old Testament character, real life dude, says this, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Pause. How often do you read the Bible and you just read? You never stop and think about what's being said. You, you, in this little verse here, here's God saying, hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you a great land. It's going to be amazing. I'm, I'm going to do great things through you and your family, your people. I want you to go ahead and get, and get ready to move. I want you to move and go. And it says that Abraham just says, okay. <laughs> There's no direction. There's no, like, detailed plan. How often do you and I want the detailed plan from God, don't we? We want God, I'm not moving a a foot till you give me the detailed plan how it's going to work out. And God's like, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And you know why it doesn't work that way? This is my personal opinion, why the detailed plan is not what we need. Because if we heard the detailed plan, we'd be like, oh God, I don't want that at all. (laughs) I don't want that at all. (laughs) I just want the result. I don't want the journey. 
Abraham demonstrates faith. He went even though he didn't know where he was going. Yet Abraham still obeyed. He trusted the plans of his heavenly father. Friends, look at this. It took a lot of faith. Faith takes trust in God. It's taking him at his word even though it doesn't make sense. And for some of us in the room, that situation that you're in right now, you're trying to be obedient, aren't you? You're trying. You're trying to be obedient to God. You're trying your best. You're pretty sure you're heading the right direction. You're not sure of where it's all leading, where it's all going to end up, because God hasn't shown you yet. But this is an opportunity of faith, which leads us to our second how-to point. Point number two, look for the opportunity of faith. Look for it. See, after you and I start learning how to listen to the crowd, and by the way, the crowd, their voice is listed in here. The encouragement coming from the crowd, primarily it's the Lord, okay, you know, through these people. But the, the encouragement comes from the Bible. If we're not l reading the Bible, then we're not listening to the crowd. And then number two, after listening to the crowd, look at it as an opportunity of faith. Instead of looking at your circumstance as like, this is going to kill me, it's going to ruin me, it's over, our marriage is done, our kids are done, my job is done, my career is done, everything's done, my dreams are done. How about you shift from that and see this instead of like doomsday, see it as an opportunity of faith. It's an opportunity for you to trust in something bigger than you. The trust is someone bigger than your spouse, than your kids, than your boss, to trust in God. And this faith, I believe, will enable us to keep going. The same faith that Abraham and Sarah had. God had told Sarah, you're going to have a baby someday. And Sarah's like, hello, I'm barren and old as dirt. There's no, they're not going to happen. There's no way. And God's like, yeah, I can do things. And, 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 and God showed up in a big way for her. He can do things. He's greater than the circumstance. See, I'm telling you, you and I, this faith, the challenge then is to not give up. When you don't know what is going to happen or when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. Now, again, naturally as humans, fear is what we deal with all the time. And we fear the unknown future. We don't know how. And we know that fear sells. Fear sells in our culture all the time. And it sells in our brains all the time and it impacts us. There's some good things about fear. There's also some really, really dangerous things that prevent us from moving forward. And fear can be a paralyzing, paralyzing emotion. Again, we don't know how it's going to work out. And it stops us from moving. Yet Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this. Faith, the opposite of fear, is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. It is faith. It is standing there and saying, I know that this situation is horrible. I know that it, it, it's, it hurts so much. But I also know my, my God is bigger. He is greater than my circumstances. My Jesus not only will win someday, he's already won. Amen? That's what we have in God. Faith moves us there past that fear. Here's what it comes down to. Even though we don't know the future, even though we don't know it, we can keep moving forward in faith because we know our God, our good and mighty God, does know the future. We keep moving. Because even though we don't know, we know he knows. And he's trustworthy. He has a plan. Have you ever heard of Super G? Super G? It's not a guitar chord or like a bathing suit or anything like that. Okay, Super G is a, actually a winter Olympic sport. All right? It's actually, and, and really it's crazy. I mean, they, these skiers, they strap on a helmet. They got their spandex Spider-Man outfit on. And they're going down this thing, like this downhill, like at like record like speeds. Insane. And, and they're trying to weave around little, little flags and things. Now, Super G, what's interesting about this is that they don't let the skiers practice the, the course before they do it. They're not, they're not allowed to practice it. They're allowed to walk down, take a ski lift up there, walk down, all the way down, check it out. They're allowed to look at it on camera, all the different angles, read about it. But they're not allowed to practice ski it before the actual event. So, therefore, wouldn't it benefit a ton if you were like the fifth skier to go down? That would be awesome, right? Because you could see other people go down. Wouldn't it also be a benefit if you had a team? Like, the Team U.S. often has three or four, you know, competitors on the same event. And, and you know those competitors are going, you know, however you got the draw, like, oh, I'm first. No problem, dude. I'm going I'm to call you up up the mountain and let you know what's going on and what I see. I'll let you know where to turn. 
where, where to bank, where to slow down. You know, that would be incredibly helpful. And that's what the, the, these teams do. These races were, were laid out for people. They would say, look out for this. See, the crowd, the great cloud of witnesses that we are given, not just in the Old Testament or by old people who, who, who died, who lived before us and died. We have a great cloud of witnesses today in what Jesus calls the church. We have people around us, not the building the church, the people around us who are walking through tough times all the time with the Lord, able to say to us, hey, I've been through this. This is what it looked like. Hang in there. Don't give up. Look around. It's coming around the corner and giving us the advice and the, and the help that we need. But again, how many of us fail to listen to it? We tune it out. We think about our own things only. We don't even ask the crowd. We don't phone it in and say, hey, can you tell us like, what's going on down the mountain here? Because I'd like to know. We, we don't have mentors. We just wallow in being alone and we fall into having a victim mentality. Have you ever heard of having a victim mentality? A victim mentality is not a good thing. And I think many of us fall into it. And here's the questions for you to answer to see if you have fallen into it. Maybe you're in it right now. See, do you find yourself blaming other people and situations for the way you feel? You might be a victim. You might be a falling into a victim mentality. How about this? Do you tend to be cynical and pessimistic? Well, yeah. <laughs> You might be living out a victim mentality lifestyle. How about, do you struggle to let little offenses go? Someone offends you, and you take it as like the worst thing ever. You're just like, God, you just hate me. I hate you. I hate you. Guys, breathe. You might be falling into a victim mentality. How about when a well-meaning person tries to give you some counsel or some constructive criticism, do you feel attacked? Ouch. You might be living that victim mentality world. How about when others won't give you sympathy or feel sorry for you? Does it upset you that they're not crying with how, how bad your story is? You get mad at that? You might be in a victim mentality. Do you compare yourself to others who have what you want? You might be someone who's fallen into a victim mentality. Oh, friend, again, Mr. Rogers, we have in Jesus Christ who holds us who's realized what he's gone through, he knows the hurt, he knows the pain. But friend, you got to understand something. You were not meant to set up camp in victim land. And some of us in the room and online have set up camp in victim land. When you were meant to just be walking through it. Because does it hurt what you've been through? Of course. But you were never meant to live here. And some of us have lived here way too long. You need to strike the camp, put all the tent back in your backpack, and heave it over your back, and keep going to victory land, because that's what Jesus has done for all of us. Amen? And when you and I don't pick up the tent and travel from victim land to victory land, we're saying, thanks, Jesus, but no thanks. Just giving him the middle finger, blowing him off, saying that we love God and we love Jesus, and he's amazing, but we don't invite him into our lives, ever. Oh, friend, Move on from victim land. Embrace the victory God not only will give you, but already has given you in Christ, which means you're not alone when it hurts. And he'll carry you through it. The third and final point today is this. After you listen to the crowd, after you look for the opportunity of faith, you need to make sure, point number three, that you lose the victim mentality. Let it die today. <sighs> you know what this is? You know what it is? Someone, someone said it was the greatest invention on earth last service, okay? <laughs> WD-40. Um, in my life, I use it to, like, silence squeaky things, okay? That's really what I, what I use it for. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm not me very mechanical, but I do know of you know, WD-40 over the years, but I, here's what I don't know, but now I do know. Don't say it out loud, okay, but do you know what the WD stands for? It stands for water displacement. That's, that's what the solution is in this camp. It's a water displacement solution that's used to make squeaky things not be squeaky <laughs> and run well. But here's the next question. Do you know what the 40 stands for? It's how many times it took for them until they got it right. 
39 failed attempts at creating the WD. 39. Each time, man, this stinks. Man, this stinks. But they kept going. They didn't give up. 39 times they failed, but they succeeded in the 40th try. The message is this, don't give up. Don't quit when you're tired. Don't quit when you fail. And don't quit when you meet obstacles. Amen? May WD40 always remind you of that. The big point today, I told you, simple. When all you can see is the overwhelming circumstance, train your eyes to see Jesus over the circumstance. Fix your eyes on him and don't give up. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you and we need you, God. We don't want to give up. We need your help because, God, it's difficult. These things that we're going through, these challenges, these, these past mistakes, these current ones, these failures, they hurt. They seem overwhelming, God. And we know that you understand. We just celebrated what you did on the cross last week. Now you rose from the grave last Sunday. God, help us to remember that you're greater than the hurt. You're greater than the pain. You're greater than the addiction. You're greater than the mistakes. You're greater than the failure. God, help us to see that you can use these missed kicks. You can, you can do something great after them. Father, thank you for showing us how powerful you are in your word. Help us these next six weeks change people's lives. Save marriages. Save those in the workforce who are just hurting so bad in their job. Save those friendships, God. Save relationships between parents and kids. God, I, I, I pray you save them and use this series. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, we ask these things. Amen. Friend, this time right now is what we call communion. And there's a little cup, if you're in the room, by your feet. And it has, and there's some juice. If you ever use it, turn it upside down first. Take the cracker out first, or it gets messy, okay? And the cracker is symbolic of Jesus' body broken for us on the cross. The wine, or it's not real wine, the juice, is symbolic of his blood shed on the cross. We are to stop and remember what he's done. And right now, what I'm going to ask you to do right now is I'm going to ask you, and get, get this, get ready for this. This is your moment to fix your eyes on Jesus. Again, God knows what he's doing. He knows this is why he has us do communion. Not just to have the religious moment. Don't make it be religious. It sucks. Make it be relational. See Jesus right now. Thank him for all he is. And then hand him the circumstance. Amen. If you want anybody to pray for you, I'll be right there. Come and talk to me. I'll be right there. If you want to accept Christ, I'll be right there. Come talk to me. Enjoy your time with the Lord.